In this example, we want to graph a rational function y equals 2x squared over x squared minus 1. Let's check in with all the different steps we need to use for our analysis of these graphing problems in order to get the graph completed. Let's begin by focusing on domain and symmetry, and then we'll come back and do all the other steps. We'll define the domain. Since this is a rational function, we'll simply set the denominator equal to 0 and solve that out. So we essentially have x squared minus 1 equals 0, which there's a few ways to solve this, but I'm just going to factor it. So we have x plus 1, x minus 1 equals 0, and so clearly x equals plus or minus 1. So these are the points not in the domain, so the domain is going to be every other point besides these. We can write the domain as negative infinity up to negative 1, union across that point, start again on the other side of negative 1, go up to positive 1 just on the left hand side, union across the point positive 1, start on the right hand side off to infinity. So while we're here, we might as well do our vertical asymptotes. Technically, asymptotes aren't down here in our guidelines until step 7, but they'll make a difference in step 5 when we go to determine our increasing and decreasing and concave up and concave down intervals. Since there's no way to cancel anything in the denominator with something in the numerator, that tells us that these values at x equals plus or minus 1 are actually vertical asymptotes. So we can quickly just say, okay, we have vertical asymptotes at x equals plus or minus 1, and that tells us quite a bit about the graph. Next, let's move on to symmetry. Recall that if we evaluate f of negative x and we get simply f of x back, that means it's an even function. Well, in this example, we have, um, it, when we evaluate f of negative x, note that we get simply 2 times negative x squared over negative x squared, quantity squared minus 1, which indeed gives us the original function back, 2x squared over x squared minus 1. So we are indeed even in this case. Okay, back to the guidelines. For step 3, we have first and second derivatives. Um, I think it's a little better to just take the first derivative and then evaluate your critical points and then incre increasing, decreasing intervals and extreme values. And then we'll come back and do the second derivative and then we'll get a possible inflection points, concave up, concave down, inf actual inflection points, and, uh, and do it all like that. So let's start with our first derivative. Okay, so for our first derivative, it looks like we're going to need to use the quotient rule here. Let's, let's write our original function again. It was f of x equals 2x squared over x squared minus 1. These get so long that you have to kind of keep rewriting your functions when you go to take your derivatives and whatnot. Okay, so here we have the quotient rule. Low d high, so x squared minus 1. Uh, there's low times the derivative of the high, so 4x minus high 2x squared d low times 2x. Over the square and away we go, x squared minus 1 quantity squared. There's our quotient rule. Let's clean it up a little bit here. Uh, let's see, how about 4x cubed minus 4x minus, well look at that, 4x cubed, what a relief. That cleans up the denominator, or the numerator a little bit, all over x squared minus x, uh, 1 squared. Okay, look at that cancellation. So we end up with minus 4x over quantity x squared minus 1 squared. Next we want to identify our critical points and we'll do that by identifying any points where the derivative is either equal to 0 or undefined. So when this derivative equals 0 we simply get x equals 0. So there's a critical point. This derivative is undefined wherever the denominator equals 0, which again we know that happens at x equals plus or minus 1. Okay, so we'll call these critical points, but they're not actually all critical points. Because critical points technically have to be in the domain of the function, and x equals plus or minus 1 are not in the domain um, of the function. So they're technically asymptotes and not critical points. So I don't know how to say that. Maybe we can put red parentheses around them saying these aren't actually critical points, but we still need to use them to test the regions around the critical points because the function could change from increasing to decreasing across the asymptotes. So we treat them like they were critical points. Okay, let's do our sign chart here. So we test all these regions 
Um, here we have 0, 1, and negative 1. So we need test points in all these regions, and we'll test it for increasing and decreasing. So we have, let's see, x equals, how about negative 2, x equals negative 1 half in the next region, x equals positive 1 half in the next region, and x equals positive 2 in the furthest right region. And remember, we're testing these in the derivative. So let's set up a nice little chart here. We have x and our derivative f prime of x, which we decided was uh, negative 4x over quantity x squared minus 1 squared. OK, so we have negative 2, negative 1 half. Leave a little bit more space here, negative 1 half positive one-half, and positive two. Okay, we'll note here that this denominator of this derivative is always positive, right, because the whole thing's squared. So really we're just testing what happens when we plug the point into negative four x. And we just need to know if it's positive or negative. When we plug negative two into negative four x, we get something positive. Same thing with negative one half, positive, positive one half, we get something negative when we plug into negative four x, and positive two, we get something negative as well. So then we can fill this in in our regions here on the sign chart as plus, uh, yeah, plus, 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 plus in the first region and the second region, and then at zero we switch to minus, 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 and then minus, minus, minus to the right of one. So we can use this information to kind of see what the function is doing. We know it's increasing and then increasing again and then it switches to decreasing and then it continues to decrease. Um, so from here we can get a sense of what our extreme values are going to be. There's just one of them. Notice that the function goes from increasing to decreasing at x equals zero. So that's going to give us a local max. Local max at x equals 0 comma whatever f of 0 is. Well remember our original function is f of x equals 2x squared over x squared minus 1 so we can quickly see that f of 0 is indeed 0. So that gives us our y value. Remember always plug into the original function to get your y value back. It's tempting to plug into that derivative because we're working the derivative but always go back to the original. Okay, so y equals 0 there. There's our local max. On to our second derivative. We'll call this f double prime of x region here. And first, let's remember what our first derivative was. Scroll off the screen there. f prime of x, we decided, was negative 4x over x squared minus 1 quantity squared. Here we go with the quotient rule again. So f double prime of x is, all right, low d high, so low quant, uh, quantity x squared minus 1 squared times derivative of the high, derivative of the numerator, negative 4, minus high, negative 4x, leave that alone, d low, so derivative of the denominator is 2 times x squared minus 1, and then the chain rule gives us times 2x again. Okay, all of that over the square and away we go. Over the square and away we go. So now this is x squared minus 1 quantity uh, to the fourth. Well, this section is more about graphing than tons of algebra, so I'm going to spare you the algebra, but I recommend doing it on your own if you're into that kind of thing, or you can just trust me. This whole thing comes to 12x squared plus 4 over quantity x squared minus 1 cubed. Okay, so there's our second derivative, once you simplify that out. Next, we'll hunt for some possible inflection points. Well, to do that, we'd set the second derivative equal to zero. Okay, so that would just be the numerator set equal to zero. Note that there's nothing the denominator can do to get us equal to zero. So 12x squared, yeah, anytime you're solving something, a rational function equal to zero, you basically ignore the denominator and just focus on the numerator. So we have 12x squared plus 4 equals 0, but we quickly run into problems because we get x squared equals negative 4 twelfths 
so x squared equals negative one third. But then when we go to take the square root of that, we have the square root of the negative, um, which brings us into the imaginary plane. We're graphing this in the real plane. So there are going to be no x values from the numerator that give us possible inflection points. However, we can set the denominator equal to zero, which we've already done, and that gives us x equals plus or minus uh, one for possible inflection points. Now, technically, these are not possible inflection points because possible inflection points must be in the domain of the function, and these are not. So I'll, again, put my little cautionary parentheses around it just to remind us that these are actually the asymptotes, but we test them as if they were possible inflection points because they do define regions that we need to test out. Okay, let's see if any of these are actual inflection points and see and check our uh, concavity here. So we'll set up our sign chart for our second derivative. Okay, we have two points to check in this case. So here's zero just for a marker, but our two main points are positive one and negative one. So we can grab x values in each of these regions, x equals negative two perhaps, x equals zero perhaps, x equals two. Though you could certainly do any point in the region you would like. Let's see how our second derivative behaves in each one of those regions. So here we have x and then in this chart we also have our second derivative. Well, f double prime of x we decided was 12x squared plus four all over x squared minus one quantity cubed. And then we have our points, negative two, zero, and two. Well, note in this case that the numerator is always positive, no matter what we put in there. So really we just need to check if the plugging in to that denominator gives us a positive or a negative. When we plug in negative two, we get something positive. However, when we plug in zero, we get zero minus one, quantity cube, which is negative, then plugging in positive two, we're back to positive again. So then in our sign chart here, we have positive, um, then it switches to negative, and this is for the second derivative, and then positive again. Okay, so it looks like our function is concave up, and then concave down, and then concave up again. So it's a good thing we checked the regions defined by these asymptotes for the concavity um, because if we would have stuck to simply possible inflection points and insisted that those had to be in the domain of the function, we would have missed the switching concavity in these regions. So let's just note that we have concave up from negative infinity to negative one, and then again from one to infinity. And then we have concave down in that middle region from negative one to one. Let's check in with our guidelines to see how we're doing. So we've made it all the way through step six and even part of step seven. The next thing we need to look at is end behavior and then intercepts and then we'll plot the graph. So let's do it. Recall that for end behavior, we take the limits as x goes out to infinity. And of course, we're looking at the original function here. So we have the limit and we'll just do this all in one step because these are gonna be the same as x goes to plus or minus infinity of two x squared over x squared minus one. And there's a few ways to look at this, but certainly uh, one of the most useful is just by dividing everything by x squared. All the terms, you, the rule of thumb says you divide everything by the highest power in the denominator. So what does this give us the limit as x goes to plus or minus infinity of two over one minus one over x squared and then we can quickly see that that comes to two because this whole term goes to zero. Though you may have also just been able to look at this original function and use the leading coefficient test to see that that's two, that's fine too. Um, okay, so we have a end behavior on both directions of, of two, which we could, we could even call this a horizontal asymptote of two. Remember, you can cross horizontal asymptotes, but you cannot cross vertical asymptotes. So we'll call it a horizontal asymptote of y equals two. Finally, we'll examine this function's intercepts. So we're looking at our function f of x equals two x squared over x squared minus one. To get the y-intercept, 
we put in zero for x. It's always the opposite variable you set equal to zero to get the intercept that you want. So for y intercept, we have x equals zero. So that's simply f of zero, which gives us zero. So the y intercept is zero. And for the x intercept, we set the whole thing equal to zero and solve. So we have 2x squared over x squared minus 1 equals 0. Remember, there's nothing the numerator can do here to help us solve this, so we simply have 2x squared equals 0, which is x equals 0. So there's the x-intercept. The only thing left to do is to plot the graph. Here's a summary of all the data that we have ascertained from this function so far, and really this is a lot right this whole list of things we've come a long way with this example so let's do it we can start with the domain there and that's everything except for plus or minus one so that ties in quite nicely with the vertical asymptotes which occur at x equals plus or minus one so let's go ahead and add in the asymptotes while we're at it we might as well do the horizontal asymptote there at y equals two we know that the function is increasing from negative infinity to negative one and it's also concave up in that same uh, region, so maybe it looks something like this, right? And you can plot points if there's any questions about this. Now, there's some reasoning that goes on here. How do we know it doesn't come up like this? Well, we don't have x-intercepts down here, so that can't be the case. How do we know it doesn't come down and then approach the horizontal asymptote like that? Well, we don't have these inflection points um, in here, and we don't have a local minimum right there, so we know that that can't be the case. So, though you could plot points to figure out more about what's going on, you usually don't have to if you reason through the information you've gleaned from the original function here. Okay, in this middle region, we have concave up, or make that concave down, and then we have a single intercept here at zero, zero. So, let's fill that in. It probably comes up like this right hits that intercept curves around and comes back down okay something like that and then well we do know that the function is even so just using that alone we can go ahead and fill in this last part it's be something like this right so you get the idea hopefully your graph looks a little better than mine but um, that's the size of it there we'll just give it a quick run through make sure we have everything good to go. It's always a good idea to check this with a graphing calculator or Desmos or something. So let's give it a try on Desmos, see if we have the correct graph. So here's the Desmos version. Note that I went ahead and put in the asymptotes as well um, to really give us a good idea of what we're looking at here. And yeah, that looks about like what we graphed by hand. So um, yeah, came together quite well.